the next question is, how do you start analyzing the data and what is what is happening now? And so I think this is a very critical point, which is not necessarily limited to our technology, but we with SimpatLab have developed a specific idea of how you then get into understanding the data in a way that you do not misinterpret what you have measured before. This has to do certainly also with consistency, but this has also to do with compensations, which are just normal in a regular putting stroke, even on the tour. And I prepared a little bit of a demo here of some slides where you can see what the idea is behind. You will see that many systems out there, even for putting, are presenting numbers and numbers and numbers. So to me, it seems that some of the systems try to impress you by presenting you as many numbers as possible on a screen. So this would mean, wow, we measure 100 different parameters and you can all see it. And they present it in a way that you are pretty impressed. So in PadLab, we have in this sheet about 60 parameters, which we might show. Uh, we even have more. We have up to 70 something parameters in SimpatLab, which we might show to you. But actually, we think the other way around. So we don't think that the number itself is important. We think it is more important that you understand what's going on in your student's putting stroke. So the number can help you to understand, but it can also distract you. So let's see what happens to this putting stroke here. And this student has an aim angle of 3.15 to the right. So if it would be one putt, if it would be only this type of information, okay, aim 3.15 to the right, you would say, okay, this person, this student is completely unable to aim to target. Uh, actually, the width of the hole is 1.5 degrees on four meters. So this is, twi is two holes beside the hole on a four meters putt. So that's way off the hole on a four meters putt. Now, at the same time, we look at consistency because we repeat it seven putts or 10 putts. And now we can see how is the degree of consistency, as we say, for this golfer. And we see the number is 0 0.35. Well, we might have the feeling 0 0.35 degrees in repetition is not too bad. Um, and there's another problem now. How can you know what it means? So where, where are you with 0 0.35? Is this good or bad? How can you judge on it? So we have now two problems. First, we need to identify if aiming off the target is a problem. And then we need to say, well, is this just a random number? And the next time he would aim three degrees to the left instead of three degrees to the right, or is he always aiming at 3.15 to the right? So we now tra would translate this, and I'll show you afterwards how we do that, into a scoring system. And the scoring system directly explain to you the significance of the data. And as far as I see, nobody else is doing it. And we have thought a lot about this normalization of the data to really help you to understand these patterns of performance, which to us is the true value of data if you are able to understand the meaning relative to an individual player's performance and an individual player's pattern of movement. So I can tell you that the average consistency for face at aim at the PGA Tour in our 150 tour players is 0 0.57. Now this player is almost twice as accurate as the average tour player, but he aims three degrees to the right. So all of a sudden we see, well, this is a player who's completely off, but he's twice as accurate as the average tour player. So how can this be? So maybe you made something wrong with a 
uh, calibration actually at impact he's almost that square to the target so it's 0 0.15 degrees to the left only consistency at impact is still extremely accurate with 0 0.39 again at impact the average tour player is at 0 point something six so still more accurate than the accurate tour player n squared impact and actually this is one of the best data sets we ever had um, it is from Tiger Woods. And uh, now, I, I might show you afterwards the complete profile of Tiger Woods, if you are interested, to show you um, how you are then able to identify um, what this pattern means if you look at the completion inside of a competence profile. But just for the, for the individuality and for the patterns, we, we started working on the tour and we thought, well, maybe there's something like a model. So we come up with a solution and then we explain to you, you need to put like, okay, let's take Brad Faxon. So Brad Faxon on the left, you see putter path in the top view. You see it's very uh, consistent, the shape, the direction, the curvature, everything is very consistent. He has a reasonable amount of arc in his path at the top view. And then at the right side, you see phase rotation. You see inside of an impact zone, which is plus minus four inches. His rotation is about, well, 5.6 degrees, which is also slightly increased. So he has a little bit more arc, a little bit more rotation. And here you see the rotation curves, the rate of rotation curves, which are very consistent. So you would say, well, this is kind of a pattern we might teach. But now you look at others like Tiger Woods. And this is now the stroke of Tiger Woods in the top view. Extremely straight, almost no arc at all. Extremely consistent, 98%. Almost dead square, 0 0.1 degrees to the right. But this is Tiger Woods' face rotation. So he's much more rotating the putter as compared with Brett Faxon. So actually, his numbers in the impact zone are 10.1 degree, so twice as much almost as Brad Faxon, but on a straight path, which is against the model, because you would say, well, if you have a straight path, you have less rotation. If you have more arc, you have more rotation. That's kind of the biomechanical model of the swing plane in a putting robot. So he's just doing the opposite by rotating just only with the hands and his swing path and swing plane is almost straight. So should I teach Tiger stroke to my student or should I teach the stroke of Lauren Roberts, which again shows some kind of arc, a little bit loop in the backswing. He's slower, so he has a longer path. So should I teach a short path as Tiger does or should I teach a long path from Lauren Roberts? And he has zero rotation at impact. So at impact, the rate of rotation is at zero. In Tiger, it's amplified. In Lauren Roberts, it's zero. So now you are in trouble. So what is kind of the model you would teach? And if we are honest, then we need to respect that. And from the very beginning, we did not try to develop a model for PubLab saying, well, this is what it should be. You should put like a robot. All the prominent coaches out there, it might be David Orr, it might be Stan Hartley, it might be Phil Canyon, they all say, well, in putting, there is no model, there are patterns. This is now widely respect, respected as they all have seen all the PubLab data in their own players, seeing that all the players have a pattern. So there is, there is no model out there. But what is kind of the common basis to now interpret this data? And so what we have done, and I just very briefly show it to you, um, and this is again something we've done in science before. So if you want to see differences against the group, you can normalize the data. So actually we decided to not compare you to one tour player, which would be very difficult because they are also different. We decided to compare you to a set of tour players. So if you Pat with Sam Butler, we compare you to 150 players 
immediately by calculating the score. So irrespective of what we look at, it could be aim angle, it could be path direction, it could be impact, so this could be, it could be tempo, amount of acceleration, whatever it is, we have 150 tour players playing the same putt, straight putt at the same distance, and we look at their behavior, at their results, and then we check how accurate are these players, what are they actually doing? So we get kind of a distribution. Some of the players, for example, aim more to the left, some of the players aim more to the right, and most of the players aim to the hole. And then we calculate for these 152 players how many are inside of one standard deviation, and out of 100 players, you will have 68 being inside of one standard deviation. Josh Albert asks, what is the distance of a straight putt that you test on? So our putt was normally chosen as four meters. If it was uphill, or if there was kind of a slope uphill or downhill, we selected the uphill putt, and if it was more than a percent uphill, we decided to shorten it maybe by half a meter to get to the same amount of speed you need to create. So basically the speed you need to create um, then deter is also determined by the length of the stroke and the amount of face rotation. So we try to um, have the same speed at impact all the time to then in our tour data set have exactly the same type of stroke which is needed to create the same speed at impact uh, for a specific part. So this was normally chosen at four meters. And if it was uphill, because we didn't find a straight part on specific greens, we choose to slightly um, be shorter. Okay. But as I said, the tour data set itself is not limited to exactly four meters. You might certainly see that the length of your path, for example, would vary if the path is becoming longer or shorter, but um, just using uh, the same data set um, to compare almost all of the data we show in our competence profile, for example, is more or less independent from a distance between 2.5 to 6 meters. Now to make it more easy, because we don't want to bother you with standard deviations, we just translate it into a score. So we say, if this is the distribution of tour players, we say that one standard deviation to the left or to the right is rated with 75% 75, 75 of score. If you are at 100%, then you are in the center of the distribution of the tour players. And if you are at 50% of score, you are two standard deviations away from this average tour player and at 50 percent you are already very much outside of what tour players would do and we do this now not only for your technical deviation which would be your aim angle we also do this for consistency so let's say your aim angle is one degree to the left so you would get a score of maybe about 80 percent and then depending on how this was, would be distributed for consistency, you would get another score. And now this is pretty easy to understand. We have two scores, which is one, the technical score for your technical deviations or kind of the, the average data value for a specific aspect. And then we have a consistency rating, which is describing your variability. And as the thumb rule, you always know if you are having more than 75% of performance, you are inside of the tour data range and the higher the number, the better. And now the trick is that if we do this for different aspects inside your, of your putting, we can directly look at the scoring to check how we need to interpret a specific average data and a specific distribution inside of a repetition of measurements. 
So we have green ranges in our reports and green bars if you are between 75 and 100 percent. We have yellow bars if you are between 50 and 75 and we would have red bars if you are having less than 50 percent. So for example here we have a player with a handicap zero, his face is closed at impact to the left zero, it's 1.5 to the left. When we look at the score this is the 54% of performance for closed impact, which is not good, but it's consistent. So he is consistently having a bias to the left. Path is slightly to the right. Uh, 0 0.9 is judged with 90, with, with 89% and consistency is still high. And we directly see that there is less issue with path because the score is just higher. And looking at the competence profile, which we'll do afterwards, you will then be able to look at different aspects and immediately see what is relevant and what not. Okay, I needed to explain this a little bit more in depth because this is basically um, allowing you to use SimpatLib, although we measure tons of data, although we have a lot of different reporting, this structure is guiding you through all the interpretation of our data, making things much more easy and much more reliable because um, we prevent of misinterpreting all this complicated data. Are there any questions on that so far? So if we now look at this kind of scheme we use, we have now a competence profile where we might look at different aspects and add kind of more important aspects um, into this competence profile, which is normally used as a first report to look at the data. So this is now some student at a performance level, as you see, very high values for technic, very high values for timing, but very low values for, for consistency if we sum up these scores. So on the left side, there is reasonable technic, not too many deviations from the tour range. Well, aim is left, but it's corrected to impact. At impact, it's inside of the green range. The bar is small. Path is almost perfect. Face coupling to path is 100% in average. Rotation slightly reduced, impact slightly tall, backswing time slightly prolonged, impact time almost perfect. So this is from his general technique, I would say, well, not too bad. And if you would just look at the numbers on the left side, you would say, well, okay, that's quite a good performance. But looking at the right side, you see most of it is very much randomized in a way that it is fluctuating way too much. So there is no general bias to the left or the right, but it fluctuates just too much. And you see the only consistent aspect is path direction. But for example, face at impact is having a very low consistency. Now by looking at the left side and the right side at the same time, you immediately are able to identify the performance level of your student and you are able to identify uh, areas of problems. So you see strengths and weaknesses, you see extreme techniques, but you would also look for uh, high values in consistency. And then there's a system behind saying we can even then go one step further and identify aspects which are more important as others. So this is a is a unique scoring system, which is not really loading you with tons of data, which you first need to interpret. It is not, not misguiding you. And we will look at Tiger Woods profile afterwards and you will understand what I mean. So on the left side, as I said, we see Technic, which is more the type of putting stroke you use, kind of more the pattern, and this might be 
flaws. These might be technical problems, but it can also, like in Tiger Woods' case, reflect compensations. On the right side, you see consistencies which are relative to your skill level, meaning that we know that the more skill you are, the better you are able to repeat it. And if something is fluctuating, it's not yet settled. And this is definitely a problem for, 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 for performance. And then just to conclude this, and we will go back to the data just in a second, um, we have another concept of interpreting the data in a functional way saying, well, if you want to hold a putt, it's basically about ball direction, ball speed. And now we sum up all the putlet data into different functional fundamental aspects. And there are six fundamental aspects which we find for putting, which is your setup and aim, your face and path angle at impact, your face rotation in the backswing and coming back through impact to finish, your path geometry and impact spot, your vertical launch and your stroke dynamics. Basically, inside of phase rotation, there's also the topic swing plane, which is not outlined here. I will talk about swing plane later. So these are kind of all the different aspects involved in putting in Sam Putlip are sort, sorted in a way that you create a hierarchy and a scheme where we know some of these aspects are more causes of problems and some in particular, if it's about impact, like face and path angle at impact, impact spot and vertical launch, these are consequences of your stroke and the upper three fundamentals are kind of determining your type of stroke by explaining how you set up, where you aim to, how you move the putter, acceleration wise, length wise, timing wise, how you rotate the putter, what is the swing plane. So we have a lot of, uh, strategies to um, interpret the data. We have developed concepts for teaching coaching, which are all then taught in our certification levels one, two, and three. And uh, if you are interested in getting to know more about all that, you can just follow our certification programs. Okay, any questions so far? Well, I can just maybe show you a couple of examples. Um, um, well, if you have done certifications, um, um, we, so refresher, it depends a little bit how long ago you are with your certification. We have um, launched a level one certification, which is available all the time on the internet. And there's a big discount if you want to do a refresher. So just, uh, it's it's not completely for free. There's a small fee, which is still there. Um, so just contact us and we will check uh, what we can offer. And I might give you certainly some access to, to some, some materials if you need. Okay. So please, please write us a mail. Perfect, Ryan. So maybe before, or, or maybe we, we start with Tiger's data because I was always referring to it already in the beginning. So this would be a profile which is not neutral as I outlined before. I will explain about reporting afterwards what you can do with reports. There are different reports which you can choose. We just look at an extended report. Uh, oh no, I wanted to show the, sorry, the competence profile first. Sorry for that. So this is Tiger Woods and his competence profile. And you see on the left side, this is, you might say this is technique, but we would say, well, this is his fingerprint, his pattern. Because on the right side, you see everything is pretty consistent. And the overall consistency of 94.1, the best player we ever had was 96.8%. So this is very close to the top level we ever measured on the PGA Tour. So he's definitely 
with a consistency in the top 10 of our tour players. But the, the, the technique is more extreme as compared to others. So his face at address is way to the right and he's over rotating a lot. He's even hitting it slightly at the toe and there's also a reason for hitting slightly at the toe for Tiger because he's over rotating. So he has a sweet spot, which is a little bit different of the center of the putter. But just looking at this picture, you will be able then to say, well, this is not a problem. So it is part of his pattern. I don't say it's good or bad. It's just information that this is part of his pattern. And if you would start changing it, you would need to be very careful what happens to impact because at impact, phase is 0 0.2 path is 0 0.1, phase to path is 0 0.2. So this is almost perfect and extremely consistent. If you would just look at, at, at the numbers on the left side, you would say, well, there's, there are problems with this technique, but basically he is just extreme, to put it that way. Not all the players on the tour are extreme. You have neutral players like Let's go to the neutral one, which is Paul Eisinger, for example. So on the left side, almost everything neutral, green, a little bit hurrying up to impact. So he's, he's aggressive. He likes the bing of the putter hitting at the ball. So he loves to hit the ball a little bit harder, but if you look at the right side, consistency, very, very high. There are others. In our example data sets, this is a player I worked with. This is Florian Fritsch, played on the European tour. Uh, everything is ab above 90. So this is how a tour player would look like if he's consistent and neutral, how it should look alike. Still, there are small screws to work with, um, even with the tour players, but they are not these big problems which you find. Okay, sorry, what happened here? Oh, I think I closed my... I think I closed my software. <laughs> okay, um, then looking at examples and showing a little bit of how you would go through a normal assessment with an amateur. Let's look at, uh, uh, yeah, there are examples. Amateur handicap 25. I said the first thing you would look at is a competence profile. Now looking at this competence profile, you would see, well, some problems on the left side, technical wise, in particular at impact, way to the right, everything seems to be a little bit right. Some timing issues. So overall, this is rated with 63%. The timing is rated with 59%. But you look at, if you look at consistency, only 30.9%. Percent, And if you look at the consistency bars here, you see definitely there's a problem with consistency throughout every aspect. And this is a typical example of a player where you would say, well, on the left side, there are some technical issues, but basically there is a lot of fluctuation. So first of all, you would need to stabilize it in a way that it's becoming a little bit more a pattern. And now based on the hierarchy, we know the pattern starts with setup aim as there are already problems with setup aim for this play would more from top to bottom. You would try to stabilize it um, already at the level of aim because the aim is already inconsistent by 15%. Now to get more information on that, you have now different reports like basic report, extended report, professional report, they are at different levels of complexity. If you go to the basic report, this is normally a report which you would give to your student, which is having some information, but uh, very limited. 
So only these three pages, you don't go into too much of details. Then we have the extended report, which is a report a little bit following our fundamentals of putting theory. So you would start with AIM. And here we can already see for this amateur why AIM is a problem. So sometimes the AIM angle is five degrees to the right, and sometimes the AIM is slightly to the left, even the corresponding numbers are over here. So the blue one is 4.87 to the right, and this yellow one is 0 0.43 to the left. So this is just too much variation. Also phase change to impact is fluctuating too much, and then as a consequence, all the angles at impact are just fluctuating too much, which means the balls don't start on the same line. They start off the target, but they also start on very different lines if you repeat it. And then we can, so this is path direction at impact. You always see single data in numbers. You can see single data in the stripes here, which correspond. The gray ranges are the tour preferences. So if you are inside of the gray range here, you are at more than 75% of score. So the score for phase is only 10% in this case, because all the bars are out or even way out of the gray tour range. Then we see path in the top view. Again, we see there are variations in the geometry, sometimes looping, sometimes not, sometimes inside, sometimes on the line. Length of backswing varies. The swing ratio varies, which is length of backswing as compared to follow through varies a lot. The curvature varies. Basically, um, the green one is even inverted to the outside. But for the others, the amount of arc varies a lot. So you see inconsistency wherever you look at. We look at impact spot. If you have problems with path, then in general, impact spot is also affected. We see there are problems left and right. There are problems also up and down. So this one is almost topped, this ball here. The lie is OK, actually, 0 0.1 toe up. So there is no problem with lie, but there's a problem with impact spot. We see launch sideways, basically what we measure as shaft angle, 2.8 D-loft. So he almost D-lofts the putter to zero loft at impact. Effective loft at impact is 0 0.2. We know you need a launch angle with an amateur with such a type of stroke should have a launch angle of two to three degrees. Two players, maybe one to two. Amateurs, two to three, so he's playing not enough loft for his level of performance. And you see sideways coming back on different heights through impact, and we see the last one has been topped. Do you see any correlation between backswing length and forward swing? Are they the same? Well, if you look at our tour data, and again, um, as I said before, um, there are a lot of discussions in the background of all our data. We were the first introducing all this data, and we were um, violating a lot of these myths out there. So we were coming up with empirical data. So th if I say backswing is shorter than forward swing, this is not my opinion, and this is also not a model. That's just empirical data, which we, which we collected out on the tour. And if we look at our 150 tour players, then the backswing is 36% of the forward swing. So follow through is 64%. It's 36 and 64. And that's empirical data of 150 tour player. Now I get emails of guys telling me, wow, this is wrong. Um, the, the stroke needs to be 50-50. I say, well, you, you might think 50-50 is good. That's a model that's maybe a teaching concept, but our reference is just empirical. So if you want to know if you are doing the same as a tour player or a different thing as a tour player, 
you look at our score system. If you want to teach 50-50, you can do that. But this is not what you find on the tour. Then this is your concept. So actually, we don't have kind of a model um, because I think the model is always very much coming um, either from a biomechanical model, which is, for example, a robot, or it is coming from your own technique, which you adopted previously in your game. So let's talk about a robot. So why shouldn't you hit the putt like a robot? Well, actually, there are very many differences to a robot. And if you look carefully uh, on what Phil Canyon says or what David Orr says, one of the basic messages is we are not putting like robots. There are a lot of differences because we putt with our hands and there is not something like a robot. Yeah, so uh, although you might think it looks li like a robot and there are some aspects similar to a robot, basically, if you look carefully, we do a lot of things differently. And this is empirically based. So this is, this is our philosophy. And uh, you need to understand everything we present in our report in this way that it's not relative to, to my model or the SimPutLab model. It is relative to empirical data on the two. And I think this is just reliable and we can prove it. So this also has been published. Uh, and even if you think your type of stroke is having more benefit for your students, you might do that. We don't say it needs to be exactly like tour players do it, but we say this is a reference. Then we have phase rotation, and in PADLAB 7, we have it a little bit different as compared to PADLAB 6. So we show now rotation from start of movement into the backswing, and here you hear top of backswing, and then you have forward swing. We mostly look at absolute rotation by looking at the impact zone, with it, which is a limited amount of distance around impact, about 5.4 degrees for this player, for this amateur inside of the impact zone, which is not too different of the tour players. So the rotation rate, which is the amount of rotation basically is 79%. So his amount of rotation is roughly in the same range as the tour players. Actually, the tour players are having uh, values which are slightly below. They have 1.8 and 1.8. So overall, tour players in this range rotate to about 3.6 degrees in average. But this is against the target line. And then we have relative rotation by looking path and face at the same time. This is kind of looking from inside of your swing plane. So rotation inside of the swing plane. So against your path is 4.8 degrees closing. So the path, the rotation is not only against the target line, it's also against your own swing plane, which is basically your, uh, your motion or displacement with the putter, which is your path. So, so you. So this player is not only rotating 5.4 against the, the target line inside of his swing plane, he's 4.8 degrees closing against his own path, saying that most of his rotation comes from rotating against the path, which is then as a consequence coming more from the hands rotating around the shaft and not coming from your swing plane. We will look at this swing plane just in a in a minute. And then we have your stroke dynamics. That's a little bit more difficult to explain, but we look at levels of acceleration. We look at timing. We look at kind of the level of speed at impact. So you see level of speed varies. The time to impact varies. So everything is just fluctuating a lot. A little bit of increasing acceleration before impact, which could be a little bit more smooth. So all this stuff could be shown in our reports. And then uh, the times in your backswing, back to impact, the gray areas again are tour players. You see backswing time more than normal range, time to impact slowed down, forward swing time again in the normal range. 
But again, for the rhythm, which is the backswing time as compared to time to impact, a lot of fluctuation again. So this is kind of a player where everything just fluctuates a lot. And if we look at details uh, of, let's say, another tour player, let's go back to Paul Esinger. We look at the same report. Just scrolling through it, you will see everything is inside of the gray area. Everything is consistent. Okay, toe up. 6.6, .6. well, some tour players do it. I think 6.6 .6 is quite a bit. Might be an issue to discuss why the toe is that much up. Well, uh, the design of the patas is, is in a way that at the heel it's flattened and you can still sit it proper, properly if you tape if you have an answer or, or blade type of putter, it might still be okay, but 6.6 .6 is maybe a little bit too much. Vertical launch 2.5, face rotation, very consistent. I said 3.6 into average, he's uh, 4.1, but the curves are very, very much the same throughout the different putts. 0, 0.0 inside of the swing plane. So this is a very neutral stroke inside of the swing plane. And then increasing to impact with acceleration. Well, there is release through impact, but before he's increasing and that's a little bit more aggressive. So we would say, well, um, again, it could be part of the pattern, maybe not the best strategy on very fast greens on breaking putts, but if you have a straight putt, he is more aggressive, it might be looking like that. And then timing, as we said, also speeding up a little bit to impact. So that's his its type of pattern. How much of a difference do you see in face balance and toe hand putters with the same player? Well, um, that's a good question, and it depends a little bit on, on your profile. So actually, if you look very carefully, there are differences, but they are not as big as you might think. But for the player, it would be a difference. So foremost, we look at consistencies and we look at patterns. So we would say, well, um, why should you play a towing putter or a face balance putter? It is changing a little bit the amount of absolute rotation or the rotation against your swing plane. And if it would match up with your type of stroke, so this means, and we will talk maybe about fitting a little bit afterwards, then we would try to match it to your type of stroke and then it would do a difference because if it's more matching up your stroke, it would be more consistent because it's uh, there's less, less interference. Just physically, the amount of fa face rotation you increase in a smooth putting stroke with playing a face balanced or a toe hang putter is not too big. There is a slight difference, maybe 0 0.5 degrees, something like that. But uh, it makes a difference for the player actually because he feels something different in the hands and that's actually what we talk about. And then to uh, maybe go through professional report, I, I just skipped the first Slide. So what you see here now is also one thing of our reporting system. You can um, combine different sizes of tiles, which we say, which is type of information. So not full screens. So here we have half screen reports or tiles, and we can also have quarter screens or one eighth of a screen small tiles. So you might then have on the left side a bigger graph and on the right side four small ones. And this is all free to be programmed by you also and to be adjusted. I show it just after that, path and spot. And then uh, after dynamics, we have other reports here, which are swing plane and shaft plane. These are also reports which are new in PuttLab 7. Swing plane is a, a fit of your path into a, a kind of a rotational movement. And this rotational movement has a tilt angle, in this case, 27 degrees. It has a radius of 1.5 meter. It has a direction, which is 0 0.1 left. And it has a low point, 
which is 54 millimeters before. So for you Americans who are maybe in the seminar or coming from English spoken countries, um, we also can switch all the um, units in between to imperial. So we can also show this with feet and inches. So I can switch it here to inch. And if I look now at the same report, you will get the same data now for feet and inches. So radius is 4.99 feet. Low point is 2.1 inches before impact. And then here you see um, data relative to the swing plane. I will explain swing, swing plane in 3D a little bit more. And this is what the shaft does. So the shaft pivot, which is the center of kind of the shaft rotation is also again, a specific radius. And then we have specific shaft lean at impact, shaft relative to path is the rotation of the shaft against the path. And then we have also a pivot. So we also have a lot of information on how the shaft moves in space and how the putter face is rotating inside of your swing plane. Do you see any pattern with the feet, how they are aligned to target always parallel or not? Well, I would say absolutely parallel you will find this not too often. And you will see that this depends on the, the orientation to the target relative to how you stand to the ball, how you perceive the target, you might open or close your left hand. So the stance is normally almost parallel. So there are also open stances and closed stances relative to the target line, but inside of a square stance, you can still open the feet more or left and this has to do with perception. So if you open the left foot, you open yourself to the target and this makes the target shift relative to you. So you perceive it at, at a different position, which often helps you to perceive it better. This is part of level one seminar and would be, would be explained much more in detail in these seminars. And then just to complete uh, this with the reports, we also have compare reports where we can just select different, let's compare Tiger Woods or maybe who else? This is, this is um, Christian Severa from, from the European tour. Um, let me compare now Paul Eisinger against Christian Severa. And you have a compare report where you see one-to-one, -one, your player maybe on the right side and the reference player on the left side. So there are a lot of options. You can pre create PDFs on that. Uh, which you can send to um, to your student. So there are a lot of options. Uh, Ryan says, uh, well, I have PATLAB 6. Can it be updated to 7? Absolutely, it can be updated to 7. And normally, um, there's not even a charge for that. Maybe you need to update also um, the 3D software. But just contact us, and we can help you with that. 